Hi there, my name is Justin Gleer. In this tutorial, we'll be going over the specifics of the post-combustion CO2 capture and storage options in the integrated environmental control model. We'll discuss some of the parameters we'll see in the CO2 capture system screens and how we might want to change them to simulate a system of our choosing. This video assumes that you're already familiar with the basic operations of the IECM. If not, you should first see the introductory video. We'll also assume that you're at least somewhat familiar with the CO2 capture technologies. If not, there's a lot more detail in the IECM technical documentation that I won't have time to cover in this video. Finally, a reminder that there is a separate video on the CO2 transport and storage components of the integrated CCS system, so that in this video, will be concentrated mainly on, this, on the capture portion of the overall system. In this tutorial, I'm going to choose a pulverized coal power plant as the plant type, and I'll call it PC Capture. From the Configure Plant tab, let's give the base plant a standard suite of environmental controls by selecting Typical NSPS Plant for the plant configuration, which is a plant meeting the federal new source performance standards for air and water pollutants. There's currently no standard for CO2 in the U.S., so we'll choose our post-combustion system directly from this menu. We'll start with an amine system as an example. This gets inserted after the main sulfur removal system at the end of the flue gas cleanup train. Note that there are options for an ammonia and membrane system as well, and the parameter displayed in the capture-related tabs will be dependent on the system that is chosen. We will go through a brief tutorial on the diagrams and parameters for each of these te technologies towards the end of the video. As you know, the next step would be to use the Set Parameters tab to specify details of the plant and capture system. But first, let's jump directly to the Get Results tab and select a CO2 capture tab where we can see a more detailed diagram of the amine-based CO2 capture process. The power plant flue gas from the SO2 capture unit flows through a flue gas blower to overcome the pressure drop of the system. It then passes through a direct contact cooler to further cool the gas. In this design, the unit also serves as an SO2 polisher to bring down the SO2 to the parts per million levels specified by the capture system vendor. The flue gas then flows into an adsorber where CO2 is captured using an amine solvent and the remaining gas is then released to the environment through the stack. The solvent, which is now rich in CO2, is pumped to a regenerator where the CO2 is released in a temperature swing process in which the solvent is heated and to release the CO2. This heat is nominally supplied from the power plant steam cycle through the IECM also has an option to supply it from an auxiliary gas fired unit, as we'll see later. That heat is transferred to the solvent via a heat exchanger, also known as a reboiler, which is part of the solvent regenerator shown here. A concentrated CO2 stream then exits the regenerator and is dehumidified and compressed to a supercritical fluid for transport to the CO2 regeneration site. The spent solvent from the regenerator is then cooled in another heat exchanger and circulated back to the adsorber. More details about this process and all other post-combustion CO2 capture systems in the IECM can be found in the user documentation on the IECM website. Now let's go back to set parameters and look at some of the input variables for the CO2 capture system. I want to start on the overall plant tab and look first at the constraints on the bottom which specify emission limits for the plant. You'll see here that there's an overall percentage of CO2 removal that you can specify for the plant with a default value of 90%. But for this example, 
Let's say we only want 85% removal, so we'll override the default and type in 85. For this video, I'm going to use the IECM default values for all the remaining plant components so we can focus on the CO2 capture system. So let's skip to the CO2 capture tab. We'll start off on the configuration screen where we can adjust the basics of the capture process. Here there are several parameters that can be adjusted in order to tailor the solvent based capture system. For an amine system we can select either FG plus which is a more advanced amine based CO2 capture system or a conventional MEA system which represents a somewhat older technology that was used a decade ago. We'll keep the default FG plus system which has been used in the most recent modeling studies. The next few parameters provide additional design options. The steam supplied in the amine reboiler is by default supplied from the steam cycle but a separate auxiliary natural gas boiler or power plant can also be used to supply the steam or steam plus electricity needed to run the capture plant. Likewise, CO2 compression can be included either inside or outside the plant boundary and part of the flue gas can be bypassed around the capture system in a partial capture system design which we'll look at later. For an amine based CO2 capture system SO2 in the flue gas can lead to a significant loss of solvent so the system includes an optional CO2 polisher as we saw earlier in the process diagram. If you select it the outlet concentration of the polisher is specified here. In the system design the SO2 polisher is coupled with a direct contact cooler used to cool the flue gas prior to CO2 capture. The temperature to which the flue gas is cooled can be adjusted here. Next is the performance screen where the removal efficiencies of the CO2 capture system is specified. These first two parameters highlighted in blue set the maximum and actual removal efficiencies for the adsorber. The maximum value is used when you select the partial bypass option we saw earlier. The actual removal efficiency has a value of 85% which is the value we set earlier on the overall plant constraints tab. The adsorber can also remove any trace acid gases or particles still in the flue gas and those efficiencies are specified here. In this screen, we can also adjust the maximum train size for the adsorber and compressor, as well as the number of spare trains. These values are used to calculate the capital cost of the system. For larger train sizes, there are economies of scale that can reduce the overall capital cost of the system. The final line on this screen is the electrical power requirement of the system, expressed as percentage of the gross plant capacity. This does not include the additional losses due to steam use, which show up as an additional decrease in the net plant efficiency. Finally, notice that most of these values are shown as calculated, which means they depend on some other choice in the model. But you can override this value by unclicking the calculate box beside any input of interest and type a new value manually. Changing this value automatically changes the calculations of other variables that depend on this one. It will also automatically change the calculations for any results that depend on this parameter value, which you'll see in the Get Results tab. Next is the Capture menu. Here we can adjust a variety of parameters that influence the performance of both the adsorber and regenerator. The technical documentation has more about each of these parameters and their interactions. The parameter highlighted in blue is especially important because it determines the loss of net plant capacity when steam is withdrawn to supply heat to the CO2 regenerator. The default value is based on case studies discussed in the technical documents. Finally, the other four tabs on the bottom you see here are discussed in details in other tutorial videos so we will not be reviewing them here. Now that you are familiar with the basics of IECM 
amine system model, we will now have a look at the ammonia and membrane options for post-combustion CO2 capture. I'll now start a new session using the same basic plant configuration, but this time, instead of specifying an amine base system, we'll now set the CO2 capture option to the ammonia system in the drop-down menu. Let's now bring up the diagram of the system by again skipping to the CO2 capture tab under Get Results. Conceptually, this is a more complicated process requiring more equipment than an amine system. In the ammonia system, flue gas again is first cooled in the direct contact cooler. Flue gas contaminants act as a nucleation site for the condensation of water in the direct contact cooler and are mostly removed. So in this system, a separate SO2 polishing unit is not used. The flue gas is then compressed to overcome the pressure drop of the system and is further cooled in another heat exchanger before entering the CO2 adsorber, where it is absorbed in the ammonia solvent. Because of the low absorber temperature, typically around 10 degrees Celsius, this process is often referred to as a chilled ammonia process. From the adsorber, the CO2 rich ammonia solvent is then pumped to the regenerator where the CO2 is released via heat with steam, just as the amine system. In an ammonia system, however, the treated flue gas must be further cleaned in a water wash section to prevent high levels of vaporized ammonia from being released into the atmosphere from the power plant stack. The ammonia cleanup step is shown here. The treated flue gas then flows through a second direct contact cooler before being released to the atmosphere. Now let's switch over to the set parameters area and look at some of the process parameters in the IECM. Under the lower config and performance tabs, we will see that these screens are nearly identical to the amine system. The parameters listed under the lower capture tab are also similar. However, there are some differences here relating to the ammonia process. For example, under the absorber heading, you can specify the ammonia slip above the absorber as well as for the overall process, which would depend on the emission constraints at your particular plant. The difference between these two levels determine the ammonia cleanup requirements. Other parameters under the chiller heat heading determine the workload required by the coolers or chillers that provide the cooling water for the system. Changing any one of these parameters can affect the overall performance and cost estimate of the CO2 capture system and thus the overall plant. Again, however, we call particular attention to the highlighted heat to electricity parameter, which plays a large role in the overall energy penalty for CO2 capture. For more details about any of these parameters, you should consult the IECM user documentation for the ammonia system. There's one more post-combustion CO2 capture option in this version of the IECM. So I'll now go back to the configure plant screen and select a membrane system. As before, we'll go to the CO2 capture tab under the get results to first look at the diagram tab. The membrane system modeled here is an ideal two-stage cascade system that captures CO2 in two stages and recycles uncaptured CO2 from the second stage back to the first stage. A membrane gas separation process has no chemical reactions and no need for sorbent regeneration. The driving force for CO2 capture is the partial pressure difference of CO2 between the feed gas and permeate sides of the membrane. In the IECM membrane model, this pressure difference of CO2 across the membrane is produced by compressing the flue gas to a high pressure at the feed side, along with lowering the gas pressure 
at the permeate side using vacuum pumps. Looking at the diagram, after passing through an SO2 polisher, flue gas is compressed to a high pressure before entering the first membrane stage. The residual flue gas from the first stage is then expanded and released to the atmosphere through a conventional stack. The, the CO2 rich permeate stream out of the first stage module is then further compressed and sent to a second stage module for further purification. The permeate stream from the second stage membrane module is the final stream of captured CO2. As in other post-combustion processes, it is compressed to a supercritical liquid state for transport to the CO2 storage site. If we now pull up the set parameter screen and go to the lower configuration tab, we can see that there are options we can select for the membrane system that are similar in nature to the amine system, including the option to bypass a fraction of the flue gas past the membrane capture system. Next, under the performance tab, we can again specify the removal efficiency of CO2 as well as several other flue gas constituents. Under the capture tab, there are several key parameters that can also be adjusted, including membrane properties, permeate side pressure, and major equipment efficiencies. The grayed out variables are shown only for reference. As with other technologies, if you have more questions about any of these parameters, please see the user documentation for the membrane system available on the IECM website. This concludes the post-combustion CO2 capture tutorial for the IECM. Thanks for your time.